Walking in the Spirit. Very simple word from the Lord. Walking in the Spirit. If you will, turn to Galatians, please, the fifth chapter. Fifth chapter of Galatians. I'm going to read three verses that have to do with my message. Galatians 5, verse 16, beginning to read. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go to verse 18, please. But if you be led of the Spirit, I want to emphasize this word, led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us what? Also walk in the Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit, we honor you this morning. We thank you for bringing Christ to us in such knowledge and wisdom and truth. Holy Spirit, that is what you have been called to do, and we acknowledge and we honor you. We pray now that you give us ears to hear, and I ask you, Lord, to give me a voice to speak. We know, Lord, that you're in this house, and we know that you want to speak to our hearts. We have hungry hearts. We hunger and thirst after truth. And, Lord, we give you. We give you all that we are and all that we have. We ask you, Lord, to make this truth a reality in our lives. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In plain words, simply this. If the Holy Spirit is in you, let him have control. Obey him. It's that simple. If he lives in you, then take orders from him. Walk in his ways. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be a constant, ever-present guide and teacher in our lives. Now, you've heard that, and you know that in theory, but many have believed this concept of walking in the Spirit is such a theological quagmire, they can't understand it, and you have to be uh, in theology to define it. And I can take you to my library, and I can show you books written by theologians, three and four hundred pages thick, and I've waded through some of them, and I still couldn't understand what it means to walk in the Spirit. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have a theological background to understand what it means to walk in the Spirit. If I ask you personally, if I could come to you and say, what, what do you believe it is? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Could you explain it to me? Could you explain it to anyone who came to you and ask you to explain Galatians, the fifth chapter? Do you have a theory even? Do you have something that you practice, something that you know works in your life? What I'm preaching you this morning is not theology. I didn't get it from a book. I got it through experience and walking in tests and trials, and that's how it comes. Most of us have no trouble believing the Holy Spirit has been brought to us by Christ or given to us by Christ. We have no problem uh, talking about his gifts. We have no problem talking about praying in the Spirit. We have no, talk, we have no problem talking about the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. We have no problem praying to the Holy Spirit. We have no problem with experiencing manifestations and believing manifestations of the Spirit. But so few of us know the walk of the Spirit. You see, you can be filled with the Spirit. And it's another thing to walk in the Spirit. And that's what I want to deal with this morning, the Lord helping us. We are missing, I think, in the church of Jesus Christ, the one truth, the one great truth that can bring rest to our soul. It's a truth that I believe can take away the distress and bring peace to the heart. And yet we have missed this. We, we have talked so much, especially in charismatic circles, about the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But there's almost little or no understanding of what it means to be under the government of the Holy Spirit. That he, he has come to guide us in all truth. He's come to direct our lives. He's come to take full control of everything we say and everything we do. 
Your walk, for example, my walk has everything to do with me, who I am and what I do and what I say and how I act. It's my lifestyle. And it's not enough for me to be able to speak with tongues and say, that is the Holy Ghost. It's not enough for me to even pray in the Spirit. It's not enough for me to talk to you about the gifts or, or uh, show forth the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I have to have an understanding. I have to know how every day in my life there's such confusion. There's so many decisions to be made. And I can't do it myself. I can't figure things out. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to take his place. He is in glory, a glorified man. He said, I can't walk with you now. I walk my season in this earth and I fellowship with my servants and my apostles and the, the multitudes. But now I'm going to glory. He said, and I'm going to give you my spirit because you see the Holy Spirit. The Bible said the spirit is the Lord. It's the spirit of Christ himself. I preach the triune Godhead. I believe in a trinity. But the very spirit that is in us now is the very mind of Christ. It is the very essence that is in Christ. The very essence of God himself. We have abiding in us. There are only two ways to walk. You walk either in the flesh... That means deciding your own way, making your own decisions, or walking in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit means that you make no move, you go nowhere, you you don't do anything until you consult with the Holy Spirit and you get His mind. That He is in full control, that I have no will of my own. I've surrendered my will to the Holy Spirit. Because He knows the mind of God and He is the mind of Christ. And I surrender my will. I have no more will. I give it to him. Jesus walked in complete submission to his heavenly father. And here it is in his own words. The son of man can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the father do. For what things soever he doeth, so does the son likewise. Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, then I judge, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus said, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And I live by the Father. And in John 4, 17, we hear these words. As he is in the world, so are we. Who do we think we are that we can do what Jesus could not do? Who are we to think that we can make our own decisions, go our own way? And we can do what we think is right. We can do even what we think is good. And we can salt with people. We can get on the phone and we can ask, is this good? We can check with our pastors. We check with our family. We check with everyone and last and probably least, sometimes not at all, consulting with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I do nothing. I don't say anything. I wait on the Father. I have no will of my own. I'm here to do only the will of my Father. And as He is in the world, so are we. As a believer and a lover of Jesus Christ... I can't conceive that I have that kind of power. I can do what Christ himself chose not to do. Surely he was wisdom. Surely he was knowledge. He was all of these things. But he waited on the Father to see what was the mind of God. Then and then only did he act and move. In the, chap- in the ninth chapter of Numbers, we, we see a very vivid picture of what it means to be under the government of the Holy Spirit. There was a cloud that appeared when Israel left Egypt. A cloud by day and a warm glow at night, a fire by night. And it hung and hovered over the people and began to lead them into the wilderness. And then when the tabernacle was built... That cloud 
descended from heaven and, and stood and, and hovered over the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle that was built in the wilderness for the Israelites. And that cloud hovered there. And they did not move until that cloud moved. By day, it was a cloud, a visible cloud, representing, I believe, the Holy Spirit and the very essence and presence of Christ revealed through the Holy Spirit. The Scripture says, So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. When the cloud lifted up from the tabernacle, the children of Israel moved on. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. They pitched tent. Then at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And at the commandment or the word of the Lord, they pitched their tents. As long as the cloud abode on the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud rested many days, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not move. If the cloud rested for just a few days, the scripture said they stayed in their tents according to to the Lord's commandment, then moved as the cloud moved. If the cloud moved even in the morning, they moved. If it moved at night, they moved. Whether it was two days or a month or a year, they moved not until the cloud moved. Not one move, not one step out of the camp. They waited for the cloud to move. The cloud would lift when it was time to go. If the cloud stayed two days, it would descend over the tabernacle. When it was time to go, the cloud would lift and begin to drift away. And they were told, they were taught, go, follow the cloud. Now, Israel sinned in the wilderness. They committed adultery and fornication, idolatry. But one thing that they were obedient in, they never, ever moved without the cloud, except on one occasion, and I'll tell you that in just a moment. And it led to disaster. At the commandment, the word of the Lord, they rested, and at his word, they moved on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a cloud. That cloud was lifted from Israel because of idolatry and sin in its final days. And that cloud was lifted to glory. But on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem, that cloud descended over 120 people. And that cloud came down and stood over that upper room, hovered over the upper room. And then it slowly descended more and came into the building. And when that cloud came into the building, it shook. And that cloud... That spirit of the living God descended further. And that cloud of fire began to break up. It began to split cloven. Tongues of fire. You see, it was a fire by night, and this is the darkest time in Israel. In that dark hour, just before the light is coming, the Spirit of God descends not only above the building, but in the building, and finally on their heads and shoulders. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said, cloven tongues of the fire sat upon each of them. And that word, cloven in Greek, means thoroughly distributed. Thoroughly distributed. That fire began to spread. And not only did that cloud sit upon them, it entered their very bodies, and those bodies became the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now they are filled with the Holy Ghost. I ask you, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Do you... Would you answer me? Do you believe the Holy Ghost abides in you? He came. We, we, we keep praying, oh, Holy Ghost, come down. Well, He's here. He has come down. But He wants to take full control of these vessels. This is His tabernacle. This is His temple. You see, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit 
But the Bible said if we live in the Spirit, in other words, if, if the Spirit is in you and, and the Spirit lives in you and you live in the Spirit, then walk in Him. Now I've asked the Lord to open up this Scripture to me, this, this matter of walking in the Spirit. And I've been praying and seeking God. Lord, I want to understand this simply. I want you to make it simple so the child can understand, because that's the only way I can come at this, because I, I, want to, I want to live it. I want to walk in the Spirit. I've been preaching about the Holy Ghost for years and years. Pentecostal background, my father and grandfather. Lord, make it simple. And the Holy Spirit, in prayer, said, the truth is, David, that and it's, this is that still small voice of the Spirit. I don't hear audible voices, but that still small inner voice. And this is what I heard that is so simple, most of us miss it. And most great truths in the Bible are missed because of their simplicity. We, we so complicated, we look for so many hidden meanings and, 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 and come at it with so many different theological ways that we miss the simple truth. And I just waited on the Holy Spirit. And finally, three little words came to me. And the Lord said, I'm giving you the golden key to understand this. And if you'll take this to heart, you can live and walk in the Spirit. And, and you can share it with others. And when I heard three little words, I said, Lord, that is too simple. So simple, I don't understand it. Three little words to understand walking in the Spirit. Just say yes. And I, I said, Lord, I don't understand that. Just say yes. Show me. Scripture, I was led to 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God are him, yes and amen, to the glory of God by us. It's not yes or no. It's not maybe. All the promises of God are yes and amen. And it came down to this. And when I began to see it, I clenched my fist and yet, yes! He, I began to go over every the promises. The great promises that he gave me. And let me go over some of these promises, the Holy Spirit, that Jesus gave us. And see if you can say yes. And see if you can read it. Clench your fist in joy. And against the devil. And say yes, because it's yes and amen. Amen and so be it. In other words, I believe it. In fact, amen means trustworthy and so be it. I can trust what Jesus said. First thing he said, and I want you to listen closely. He said, I have established you. I've anointed you. I've sealed you with the Holy Spirit. I have filled you with the Holy Spirit. Do you say yes? You can't walk in the Spirit until you believe that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't flirt or flit in and out of our lives every time we're in trouble, every time we do something wrong. He's still there. I need him more when I do wrong than when I'm going right. Secondly, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that he will abide with you forever and he will lead you into all truth. He will take that which can be known of Christ and he will show it to you. He will guide you. He will lead you. And he'll bring you into the truth of Christ. Can you say yes? Yes. You know I never try to work a crowd. (laughs) I usually say don't say anything. Don't clap. But I'm so excited on these simple words of walking in the Spirit. There has, there has to come a divine yes, intractable, positive, definite, no possibility of maybe or no. Yes! 
I ran around my room, my fist clenched. Yes, every promise in the book is mine. When I was a, a boy in my dad's church, they had a song they sang almost every week. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. And the promise of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. And the early church in my boyhood time believed that and lived it. And we do it again today. Jesus promised that there would be an inner voice, a guide, a teacher. He would glorify Christ in you. He would show you things to come. He will show you something about where you to go and how you're to go. Can you say yes to being guided by the Holy Spirit? And here's a promise. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He, who? The Holy Ghost. He will direct your path. He will direct your steps. And when I was praying about this, I said, but Lord, what about the safeguards? Because I, 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 I'm about to order a book. It's a theological discourse or lecture about uh, all the dangers of listening to inner voices. You see, the flesh has a voice. The devil has a voice. And the world has a voice. How do I know it's the Holy Ghost? How do I know it's the Holy Spirit? Now, there are many of you listening to me now and many in the ministry who can't accept this walk of having a constant, uninterrupted voice of the Holy Spirit directing your life. Because you have tried to trust that voice or tried to hear the voice of the Lord and somewhere, sometime you made a mistake or you say it didn't happen. I thought I heard the Holy Ghost, but it was not the Holy Spirit. Now, there are safeguards. God would never allow his people who seek to be led by the Holy Spirit and walk in the Holy Spirit as directed by the word and then let them be deceived. Impossible. Not when you're on your face, not when you're seeking him, not when you're asking for the cleansing and not when you believe that the Holy Ghost mortifies the deeds of the flesh. Only the Holy Spirit. You cannot mortify your sin. There's no other way but faith in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you mortify the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit, you shall live, the Scripture says. Now, let me talk about the safeguards. Ephesians 6.16. What about... You see, see, if if you're going to have the safeguards, it requires another divine yes. It has to be an intractable divine yes. Uh, 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 I will believe. If I'm going to walk this kind of walk, I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit will keep His word. I'll take these other promises. He has promised to protect us. These are protective promises. So that we know the voice. Jesus said, the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit, but you know him. You know him. You know him by familiarity, by spending time with him, by trusting in him. But let me give you the safeguards, please. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the shield of faith. That you may be able to quench the devil's voice, every word that comes from his mouth, everything he tries to, in, in, to, to inject into the, to the mind. These are fiery darts of Satan. And there is only one protection, and that is to believe what God said. If you will believe me, if you will take this step of faith, and you will consult me, if you will walk in the Spirit, In other words, trust him that when you seek him and when you believe that he abides in you and that he has a voice, that he will speak and he will lead and guide and keep you from evil. He will keep you from disaster. He will keep you from these terrible mistakes that we make in life. He said, will you believe that I have a shield? I am your shield and I will protect you. I will keep it and trust that he knows how to do it. There's no preacher anywhere can explain how he puts up the shield. 
My part is to believe that he has promised to be a shield to me. And I go to prayer, waiting on the Holy Spirit and praying, Holy Spirit, you shield me from any voice of the enemy. You shield me from the voice of the flesh. There's another scripture. For the flesh lusts or fights against the spirit. And we're talking about now discerning the Holy Spirit from the spirit, the voice of the flesh. And here's the promise. The flesh lusts or fights against the spirit. And the spirit fights against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. And now you have the voice of the flesh and you have the Holy Spirit in my heart. There, there, in this body of mine, there are two voices that are clam- the, the, the voice of flesh always clamoring for attention. And always trying to tell me what to do. Always tell me it's right. Always tell me go to get some counselors to agree with my way. And then go to God and pray and God has to bless it. Do it my way and then go to prayer and ask God to just bless what I have. I hear people say, well, God's given us a sound mind. We have an intelligent mind. And, and God helps those who help themselves. And, and I'm just going to use my intelligent spiritual mind. Well, then you're acting on your own will, I believe. Yes, he does. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying you go to your closet and say, Holy Spirit, what dress do I wear or what color suit do I put on today? I'm not asking you to go to the Holy Ghost and ask him what cereal you pick for breakfast. I'm asking you for all of these, all of these things that have to do with walking. Walking. Those decisions in life that are so important that we never act. You don't have to go into a closet. You can, you can do it sometimes in just a few moments. You stop. You see, the Holy Ghost is never in a hurry. He's never in a rush. He said, be still and know that I'm God. And you just wait for a moment. If you stop, I don't care where it's at and what the issue may be. Holy Spirit, you abide in me. What is your mind? What is your word? He'll never fail. Now, here's the voice of the flesh. And here's the Holy Spirit in this vessel of mine. Who do you think is going to win this war? The flesh or the Holy Ghost? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. This is not your war. It's not mine. I go to the Holy Spirit and I claim this promise. I claim this, that you're at war. It's not my war. You're, you're the one who's contrary to my flesh. I don't know how to distinguish the flesh at all times, but you know what is flesh. Holy Spirit, I believe you to quench the flesh. I believe you to break through every barrier of the flesh and give me your mind. Never once will God fail. Ephesians 14, 4, 30, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And that word grieve, sadden. Don't sadden the heart of God by neglecting the ministry of the Holy Spirit for which he's been sent. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness because of their unbelief? Israel's most grievous act of unbelief is found in the first chapter of Deuteronomy. It was a time that the cloud was about to move across into Canaan and then the cloud would be lifted. And they were told, they stand there on the side of the river, and the Lord says, now it's time to act, it's time to go on. Go in, I've made you the promises, you go now. Go into the in, into Canaan. This is where the cloud was moving. And they said no, and they rebelled against him. The Bible makes it very, very clear. Moses said, you did not believe God's word. Not one of you shall see the good land. You will die in your despair. God was grieved. Now, God never left them. Even though they were not going to obey God at this time, God was faithful. He saw them through the wilderness. 
God doesn't drop his people for even an unbelief. God still, they, we don't believe, the Bible said he remains faithful. He still loved his people, though they're in belief. But you see, they missed the blessing. They, they missed the life that God had planned for them with rest, divine rest. The Bible in, in Hebrews said they missed the rest that was promised. Because they did not move with God. They didn't go with God. They didn't obey his word. They didn't go with his direction. And then they gird themselves, the Bible said. They said, well, because now they were told, God's not going to go with you. you you're choosing your own way. And so they said, the Bible says they girded themselves. They put on their weapons. They had no direction. The cloud didn't go with them. And yet they went up the hill to battle against the enemy. They said, we're going to go in. They go up the hill. The Bible, the Bible Moses told me, he said, you're going to be chased as bees are chased, as bees chase you. In other words, you're going to hit a bee's nest because you're going your own way, making your own decisions. God's not with that. And the Bible says they were chased as with bees. Now, folks, I look back over my life and the times that I acted without consulting the Holy Spirit. Not just to get permission, but say, Lord, is this your will? Is this what you want? And when I've acted on my own volition, and when I've taken my own will at hand and did what I thought was just right, and thought I was smart enough and intelligent enough to know what was right and wrong, and I've acted that way, I've every time looked back over my life, as many of these issues that I can remember, of all these times I've acted in my past 50 years of ministry, I've always run into that bee's nest. I've always been chased by distress. I've always found it just like sand sieving through my fingers. But when I've obeyed the Holy Spirit, He's always blessed. And He's always been there. Years ago, some over 40 years ago, in a little town in Pennsylvania, the Holy Spirit spoke to me clearly. Go to New York City and work with gangs and drug addicts. And it was a clear voice. Now, you just don't pick up when you're in a little town of 1,500 people up in the hills of Pennsylvania. You just don't get up and go unless you know God sent you. And then you don't go tell your wife you're going to move to New York when you have a nice little cottage with a picket fence and nobody around to bother you. No neighbors. You see, you have to hear from God. And I heard from the Lord. He said, go to New York and work with drug addicts. And I moved with the cloud. The cloud was moving. I, I moved with that cloud. I said, yes, Lord. And I look back over those years, and now over 500 Teen Challenge Centers around the world, 500, thousands and thousands of drug addicts being saved. I'm not boasting, but in the faithfulness of God. But, you see, I had been on my face for weeks and weeks, praying that God would speak because... Often when God's trying to lead us, he'll stir the nest and we have that divine restlessness and we know God's trying to get our attention. And I look back over my past life. And I came to New York City and four or five years later, after coming, obeying the Holy Spirit, the Lord spoke clearly to my heart, write a book. And we called it The Cross and Switchblade. And that book went all over the world. And it's opened doors so that now, in my latter years, I can go anywhere in the world. And that book God used to open up the doors. Because, you see, the cloud moved. And the cloud said, do this. And I did it. I obeyed him. Now, folks, there were a lot of times I didn't. And in between all of these blessings I'm talking about, there there were times of, of loving, chastening from the Lord because I ran off and did my own thing and it blew up in my face. 
I could write a whole book on just that. It'd be bigger than the cross and Swiss blade. <laughs> Eleven years ago, I was driving down the interstate in Pennsylvania, one of the interstates. And I, I had some tapes that had been in the car for months. And I picked up this tape and I put it in the tape player on the radio in the car. It was Pastor Conlon. And uh, Holy Spirit said, put another one in. In the second tape, I heard a voice. And the Holy Spirit said, pull off the robe. I said, why? He said, there's a telephone number there. Call him and invite him to preach. And so I got on the phone. I got Sister Teresa. And I, I don't remember all the details, but here he is. Still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I believe this. I believe with all my heart. And I have made an irretractable, absolute, positive yes to every promise in the book. And to believe that what Jesus promised me is true. That this Holy Spirit in me will guide me. He will lead me into all truth and show me things to come. He'll show me the road. This life is possible. The last one I want to talk about was five years ago. The Lord said, in your last days, and uh, I don't have any premonition of an early death. I can't die an early death. I'm already past the... (laughs) I'm four years to the good beyond the promise of 70. I know I don't look it, but I am 74. (laughs) That was flesh. (laughs) <laughs> but the Lord said, I want you to share your time with pastors, and I want you to go to the nations. And we've been doing it for the last four years, and the Lord's been faithful. I want you to stand. And this is not flesh. Flesh. I want you to do something finally, and I'm not, I promise the Lord, I'm not trying to whip you up. <sighs> Are you tired of making such terrible decisions that just mess up? And are you ready now? To say, I hear something from the Holy Spirit. If he abides, if he lives in me, and I live in the Spirit, then I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to surrender my will, and I'm saying, Holy Spirit, govern my life. (sighs) Govern my life. You and I are under the government of the Holy Spirit. And that's how Jesus intended it. To bring us into the relationship with Christ that the Father so desires for us. Are you willing to give one irretractable? In other words, you can't take it back. You say, Lord, the best I know in my heart, I mean it. I want to say a great, powerful yes. Let me hear it. Yes. Yes, Lord. Father, Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Jesus, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to be a church that walks in the Spirit, that we hear from God, that we hear that still small voice saying, yes, follow me. My promises are for you. Let it be. So let it be. Yes and amen. 
Not nay and yea, not yes and no, not maybe, but yes. Every promise is mine, so be it. Glory to God. If the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and you have to confess unbelief and fear. If you don't know Christ, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I invite you to step out of your seat and come and receive him as Lord and Savior. And to you, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit drawing you. It's the Holy Spirit that comes to draw you to Christ. And I, we've been lifting up the Holy Spirit as we've been directed by the word. We're to honor the Holy Spirit and we're honoring the Holy Spirit. And as we honor him, he does his work. That means he's come to you and, and pricked your conscience or he has quickened your spirit. And he wants you to yield to him. If you've backslidden, if you've, you've grown cold to the Lord, join these that are coming. And if you're here, we have never, ever, none of the pastors ever tried to pack these altars or just have people standing, you know, filling it, all the aisles and everything just for show. God forbid. But if you are drawn by the Spirit this morning and you have been living in doubt and fear and unbelief and you've been going your own way and you say, Lord, I want to make a stand. And if you feel that of the Holy Spirit to come, you follow these that are coming. And in the annex, you just go stand between the screens and I'll be praying for you in just a moment. And let's believe the Lord that when you walk out of here, you you walk out of here with a confidence. You walk out here with a confidence. Bring your sins to Christ. Bring your unbelief. Bring your doubt. Bring your fear. We'll pray with you in just a moment. We invite you to step out and, and take your stand. Holy Spirit, we have shared with this congregation what we believe is your heart for this hour. And we pray now, Holy Spirit, you will come down and make this real to us, make it a reality. And for these that have stepped out, Lord, only you know what the battle is or what the struggle is or what the need is. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to meet that need. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, now to open their eyes and their hearts. And Holy Spirit, draw them now into the love of Christ. Draw them by your power now, Jesus, to, to bring rest to their weary heart and mind. Only you can do that. I can't. <laughs> Come now, Holy Spirit. We honor your abiding presence. Thank you for your drawing, Spirit, how you draw us. And you're drawing us to a deeper walk, a closer walk. Do that now, I pray. And I want you to pray this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. And now, Holy Spirit, I believe that you live in me. And my body is your temple and that you're in the temple and that you do speak. And I can trust you to make your voice known and to clear the path so that we know that I know that I've taken time to be with you and to listen to you and hear that still small voice. That says, this is the way, walk in it. Now let me pray for you again. Heavenly Father, I'm asking for those that have backslidden, that you bring them back to a knowledge of your love, that you still love them, and that you want to make this the first day of a new beginning. And those, O oh Lord, who are struggling with a sin that has controlled their life, and they've cried and they've wept and they don't know how to get free. 
Let them understand that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. If they will trust, the Lord will come and he will mortify. That means he will he will put underfoot. He will conquer every evil deed of the flesh. We trust in that covenant promise. Now, Lord Jesus, for those now that want to take a step of faith and go out now and say, Holy Spirit, I hear it. I'm going to walk with you. Just going to walk with you and talk with you. And let you be my personal guide and my strength. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the conclusion.